Hello, today is June 23rd, 2009, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Primo Gentili. Welcome, Primo, and thank you for coming. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Italy, uh, November 30th, 1921. And did you grow up in Italy? No. Where did you grow up? Here in the, uh, in the United States. And where, when, how old were you when you came over to the United States? I was nine months old when I came over. Now why did you come over? Because my father uh, always wanted to come to this country and he had a a visa to come over and uh, he came over ahead of us and set up housekeeping and got himself a job and as soon as he, get, as he got established he called for my mother and I. And yeah. where did you settle? What Did you settle in Massachusetts? We settled in Framingham. Framingham, Mass. Framingham. And did you grow up in Framingham? Yes, I did. Did you graduate from high school? No, I didn't. And you're currently living you where? In Natick. And your marital status? Married. And do you have children? Well, I have two boys. Grandchildren? None. And growing up in Framingham, what was it like for you back then, as compared to today? What do you remember most? Well, Framingham was a quiet town. I can recall going downtown and you could practically close your eyes and walk across the street and not worry about being hit by cars because there weren't that many. As opposed to today? As, as opposed to today, yes. And uh, it, it, it was a nice, clean, easy going town. And you did have some schooling in Framingham? I went to school, junior, uh, junior, I went to junior high school and it was time to go to, to high school. I didn't want to go anymore. So did you work? So my, 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 my parents at that time, they, had, they, you know, they, they didn't know about education too much. So they said, well, if you don't want to go to school, you'll have to find yourself a job, go to work, which I did. I and worked in the shoe factory. And where was that? In Framingham. How old were you then? Uh, About how old were you? Oh, I forget. <laughs> Eight, 17, 16, 17 years, mm -hmm. something like that. And where and when did you enter the military? How old were you when you entered the military? I believe I was about 19, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. And why did you enter? I entered because at that time I wasn't working in the shoe factory anymore. I got laid off and uh, or I quit because the pay was very little. So uh, jobs were very hard to find. And my father would be after me every day. Did you go look for a job? Yes, I did. I don't believe you. What are you doing hanging around the corner? I said, well, because I already went looking for a job and I couldn't find any. Was this well, during the Depression or? Yeah, right after, after, the, right after right the Depression. Right after the Depression, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father would hound me every day. I don't think you're going looking for a job. I, yes, Pyra, I do. I do. I go look for a job. So finally I got fed up with it. And some friends of mine decided they couldn't find a job either. So we decided, why don't we join the service? And uh, we went in Boston. And they signed up for the, for the Navy. There was three or four of us went in. Three or three of them went in the Navy, and I didn't want to go in the Navy because it was the hitch was too long. So I, I went to the Air Force, and that was only for four years. And that was the Army Air Force at that time. Army, Army, Air, well, Army Air Corps at that time. Army Air Corps. And how many years would you have to sign up for? Four years. Of course, I stayed longer because you, you couldn't get out when the, 
in wartime, you can't get out. You're, you're in for until it's over. Sure. Um, where were you sent initially for basic training? Savannah, Georgia. And was that your first time down in the south, or had you traveled before? Or? I've never been down south before. What was it like for you going to a new area of the United well, States? It was, it was very strange because uh, everyone, everyone that was in my outfit in basic training at the time, they were all suddenness. And they were speaking with that sudden drawl. And I had a hard time understanding them. And, uh, but I got accustomed to it. You did. Uh, and uh, everything worked, worked out fine. And when you were in basic training, what do, you, what do you remember liking or disliking the most about it? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, everybody had to pull detail like KP and cleaning up and all that stuff there. Well, yeah, I didn't like that part. But uh, the rest of it was uh, uh, assignment, like go out in the hangars. Of course, I was in basic training, and I would go out in the hangars, cleaning up, sweeping floors, and, and chasing, sending, sending you on uh, a prank, like they'll give you a, a bucket and say, uh, go over the hangar number two and ask for some prop wash. And uh, so I'd get the bucket, not known, being a greenhorn. I'd go to the next hangar and I'd go in there and say, uh, the come, uh, sergeant over there wants me to get a bucket of prop wash. Oh, uh, let's see now. I think we just ran out. Why don't you ask so-and-so over there? Well, I found out afterwards, a prop wash is the wind from a propeller. Oh. <laughs> so they were just teasing you. They're teasing me, sure. Mm -hmm. But you a, learned quick prank. enough. Sure. But I, I learned quickly. So. so during basic training, did you get any specialized training or any, anything that you were going to study over and above basic? Uh, no, we, we really didn't have any combat training or anything with guns. Uh, they just, we were there to, to learn, uh, you know, fix airplanes and keep the airplanes running, and that's more or less what we did. So you were going to be the Air Corps mechanics for these planes? I, yeah, they, they, said, they did send some, they couldn't send everybody. They, they had to keep somebody to do, uh, you know, to help around, clean up and all that. But in the meantime, you also on the job training. So I was one of those that were on the job training like. And some of them did go to school. Mm -hmm. And so after that, you're in Savannah, Georgia. What, what time of year were you in Savannah? Do you remember when you went in? Uh, I went in and it was, uh, it was in the winter time. I know that. It was, uh, well, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, while you were in Georgia, they bombed Pearl Harbor? Yes. Now, when you went to Georgia, did you have a choice of where you could go? Yes, they, they gave me three choices. Uh, I, I was asked if I wanted to go to Puerto Rico, uh, Hickam Field in Hawaii, or Savannah, Georgia. Well, I've never been away from home before, and I'm just a, just a young kid. So I said, well, at least if I pick Savannah, Georgia, I'm closer to home. I'll have a chance to get home once in a while. So I picked Savannah. And having been in Savannah when Pearl Harbor was, born, bo um, was bombed, I'm sorry, how, how did you feel about that, knowing that you could have been, because not only did they bomb Pearl Harbor, was Hickenfield also in danger? Yeah, they bombed Pearl. They, at the same time, they bombed Pearl Harbor, they bombed Hickenfield. So you conceivably could have been... I, could, I would have been there, you would definitely. Have been there. Definitely, I would have been in Hickenfield. So when you heard about that, did you feel like um, somebody oh, was watching over God. you? God was with me. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And when you, when you heard about the bombing, 
did things tend to accelerate in what you were doing with your training and, and um, mechanics or? Uh, well, we didn't know what was going on. At that time, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, that day, it was on a Sunday, we were, I had gone to, I had gone to the movies with a couple of fellas. And uh, when we came out of the movies, I didn't know about it until we came out of the movies. When we came out of the movies, all these people that were driving by with their car, they had their radios on, it was all over the radio. And they said, hey, soldier, they want you back at, uh, back at the base right away. They bombed Pearl Harbor. I said, Pearl, what's Pearl Harbor? I never heard of Pearl Harbor. They said, they bombed Pearl Harbor, they want you back at the base. Okay, we went back to the base. Now, what was the name of your base? Uh, Hunter Field. Hunter Field. Mm -hmm. So once you got back, did you learn more about what was going on? When we got back, the commanding officer says, we don't know. They may bomb us too, so we don't know. All our planes were wingtip to wingtip. So we had to go out and disperse all the airplanes, move them, move them, disperse them, just separate them in the field. And, uh, and, all, and then when we got through with that, he said, I want to see everyone here and uh, I'll let you know what, what we're going to do next. So when we, got, uh, when we dispersed all the planes, we got back to, and the squadron commander says, I don't know what's going to happen, but my instructions are to pass out sidearms for every one of you. They gave us 40, 45 sidearms. We all had sidearms. Now, had you had any training in those? No, we didn't even know how to shoot it. But they gave us sidearms. So they, they said to us, uh, you know, one, one of the fellas says, what if we go in town? Uh, what do we do? Well, you know, what do we do with the guns? He said, take them with you. He said, we're in, we're at, um, I don't know if we're at war yet, but you take those guns with you. So you were all on what I so would we call went, high alert. So we went alert. to town, we took the guns with us. <laughs> so you were on that high alert. That didn't last long. Sure. You were on high alert or something of yeah, that nature? Yeah, we were on high alert. Mm -hmm. And then how long did you stay in, at Hunter's Field before you one were year. shipped out? One year. It's exactly one year. Yeah. And so when did you go from there? Did you go into the Pacific? From there, we boarded the troop train. Back then, they didn't fly you like they do now. Now, you, and then back then, they, everything is by train, bus, or uh, ships. We got on a troop train and went to uh, California, San Francisco, California. And we had to wait there for one week before we boarded the ship. And so then you were on a ship for the first time? For the first time. What was that like? What was that experience oh, like? Crowded. Crowded. Yeah. Very crowded. Did you experience any kind of seasickness, which some might have? I didn't, but a lot of them did. Yeah. Um, and did you have sleeping quarters, or were you above deck? They had us down in one of the holes where they, where they store all the cargo. One of the holes they set up into bunks. They were probably about four or five bunks high. And it was hot, very hot down there. So I never slept on there. I slept on deck. I got a blanket and went up on deck. Did a lot of others and, do that too? And a lot too? of others did too. Mm -hmm. And where did you go when you were shipped out? Well, we really didn't know where we were going. Uh, we knew we were going to Pacific, but we didn't know if we were going to uh, uh, the different, different islands or where. We found out later that we were going to uh, Australia. Now, what? And it took us, uh, took us about 20, 21, 22 days to cross that ocean. We zigzagged all over the ocean. And you zigzagged because? Of the submarines. submarines. In fact, uh, we had three submarines chasing us. And you knew that? We knew that. And how old were you at this point, around 19? About 20. 19 or 20? 19, 20, 20 yeah. What about was 20. that like for you, knowing that you were being... Um, 
chased down by the enemy submarine. Well, they, they shot torpedoes at us a couple of times, and the, the ship made a sudden turn, and uh, <laughs> of course you lost your balance because it was such a steep turn. And the torpedoes just missed us because, you, because we turned. Do you remember the name of the ship? Uh, I think it was the Acorn. Acorn? Yeah. So before you even no, get over... Oh. No, wait a minute. No. That wasn't... No, I really don't. Okay. That was the ship I came over. My mother brought me over from Italy. On the Acorn. That was the Acorn. Okay. You knew you had that name in, <laughs> in your mind for mind, some yeah. reason. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the name of the... So here you it are. It was a Liberty ship, I know that. It was a Liberty ship, okay. And when you were going over, were you with a, your unit? Were you with friends? Yeah, just about everyone from, that was, came from Savannah. Was with you, yeah. yeah. And on the way over, what did you do to bide your time? Do you remember? Uh, well, one thing was you had to stand in line or breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the line, you stand in line for three, three and four hours. Waiting. The lines were so long. It wasn't only my outfit, it was thousands, thousands on, on the ship. So a friend of mine said, you know, why don't we volunteer for KP? That way there we'll be in the kitchen, working in the kitchen, and we don't have to stand in line, and we get everything, all we want to eat. And is that what you did? We did that, yeah. That's great, that's great. So when you, when you got to your destination, what was your destination, do you remember? Brisbane, uh, Brisbane, Australia. And when you got to Brisbane, was it summertime there, which is kind of it the was opposite? Some, it was summertime there. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, it was always warm there. There's no winters. Winters is always warm. So were you stationed at a campsite or a base, uh, they an had army us, base? They had us camped out at a racetrack at that time. And uh, we stayed there for a week. And then they unloaded the ship with all our equipment, uh, which were consisted of uh, like... Uh, like 18 wheelers uh, boxed in. Uh, we had uh, weld welding shops, sheet metal shops. Uh, all each each trailer, each each truck or trailer had a, a workshop, and that's what we had to take to the base we were going to. And and what base did you go to? And we went to Charters Towers which was no roads. We couldn't put the, put the trucks and everything on the, on the trains because the trains were narrow gauge and they weren't wide enough to, to haul our equipment. So we had to drive all that equipment. It took us two weeks to get there, going through jungles, no roads. We had to make, a ro make our own roads. And, and, in, and in doing that, did you, were you in a safe place? Did you know if any of the... There was uh, no, no fighting going no on fighting at that, that time. That no, time. no. Mm -hmm. not, not, not at the first base we went to. And once you were on the base, you set up... Set up camp. Camp. And got the planes ready for... Uh, the planes used to fly from our base to the combat areas go out, uh, probably bombing something to spot some enemy ships, and then go out bombing the enemy ships. So they would go out and they would come back, some of which maybe were damaged. Oh, and, many and, a times. And, and then you and your crewmates would have to... Repair them if we could. And what, what were some of the things that you would have to do? Most, a lot of it was the plant, they were like the, they would shoot bullets, uh, you know, the bullets would pierce the wings 
and we had uh, bulletproof uh, wings, I mean bulletproof tanks. But the bulletproof tanks, after a while, the chemicals that, uh, that were in there to stop the leaks would keep oozing out and it would displace the, if it had so many gallons, it would displace the amount of gallons it would hold. And we had to change the tanks because uh, you couldn't put enough gas back in there again because uh, the, that chemical would expand and displace where so the it, gas would go. So, so we had to change the tanks. And sometimes that could be hazardous for you too, correct? <laughs> Hazardous. It was we couldn't do it in the daytime because we had to get inside the wing, take take the panels off underneath the wing, and it's just a small area, and we had to get up in there and fold fold the tanks that were made of rubber, fold the tanks, strap them down with straps like like a seat belt or something, strap them down and then pull them out of this small hole, and we couldn't do it in the daytime. It was too hot, so we had to do it at night. When it cooled down. And would you do it under lights, or oh, in, yeah, and yeah. would it be outside that you were doing this? Oh, we didn't. We didn't have no hangers over no there. No hangers. Everything is outside. Sure. Everything's outside. Any um, thinking back? Any issues where you would sort of befriend certain airline airplane pilots or their crew or a cer certain planes that you were responsible for, or was it? Any planes that came in at all? Uh, any plane. Mm -hmm. yeah. We took care of everything. And you would have to sometimes replace engines and things of that nature. Yeah. So in doing that, did, was this a learning process for you as you went at along? At the beginning, I was more or less like a, a hopper. Mm -hmm. you know, get this, get that. And after a while, they'd take an engine off the plane and have a new engine set right aside of it. And that probably they'd say to me, all right, all right take, take all the spark plugs off. Uh, how much, you don't need much training for that. Sure. So that was an easy job. We, you know, so I took the spark plugs off, and then they'd give me the new plugs, and I'd put the new plugs in, and uh, take the wiring off, the wiring harness, so I'd take the carburetor off. Well, anybody could take parts off and re and. As every, every now and then they'd let me install the parts. Mm -hmm. But little by little I started getting doing more and more and more. And mm -hmm. After a while it became uh, Easy for common. you to do. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, when you were in Australia, did you know that that was only a temporary base for you, that you would be moving on? Did you hear any of that? Uh, yeah, we knew that we were going to move on because every time they start pushing the Japs bases further and further away, we would move further and further, or closer and closer to them. Meaning to another island? To another island. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So after Brisbane, where did you go? From Brisbane, we went to uh, Charters Towers. And, and where was Charters Towers? Uh, that was uh, a very small town uh, inland, closer to, there, was, there wasn't, uh, they had, there was no, no combat bombings in Australia at all. From Australia, you know, we used to fly, our planes used to fly to New Guinea. Okay. And so we were more in the n closest point to New Guinea. In Australia. In, in Australia. And then did you eventually go to New Guinea? Yes. And this was when the U.S. was in the thick of it, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was it like for you when you arrived in New Guinea? What do you remember about that? Well, uh, oh, a lot of jungle, a lot of jungles, and uh, thick brush, high mountains, very high mountains, and uh, there were a lot of valleys. I mean, uh, open, open fields, and jungles, but surrounded by mountains. 
and that's why would they put out they would put the airfields in the valleys. And were the people of New Guinea fairly primitive back then? Did you meet any of them? Um, mm, I didn't meet any because it was it was all isolated, and uh, they did have Aborigines. And did you natives. see? Did you see any of them? Yes. Yes. Were they friendly towards you all? Well, they, they were pretty more uncivilized, sort of. Uh, they, uh, they had no, uh, <laughs> uh, the women, the women who were bare-chested. Mm -hmm. the, the little boys who were running around with no pants on. And even the men, no pants on. So very Probably primitive Probably just a little area. cloth over them or something. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they weren't civilized. Did you basically stay away from them, or did any of the... Um... Uh, well, they weren't close to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They weren't close to us. So when you were in New Guinea, your planes were going out on missions. missions yeah. How long would they be gone for? Uh, for, the, for the whole day. And then... Was it difficult when some of the planes didn't come back? Oh, we used to count them. We used to count the planes, see if there's no, oh, I got four planes missing. And we'd look, scan the skies, waiting and waiting. And a lot of them never showed up. We lost, we did lose a lot of planes. And did some come back basically by the skin of their teeth also? Some of them, I don't know how they made it. Really? They, some of them, they, they landed and uh, they couldn't even tax, taxi to where they're supposed to go. They, 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 they just shut the engines off and left them there. And we had to go out there and, and uh, drag them in, <laughs> more or less. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, did, did you see a lot of injury? Yes, uh, a lot of times uh, the planes would land and there would be amb ambulances going out there chasing the plane. And as soon as they stopped, they'd take in engine off the planes. Mm -hmm. And was there a hospital on the base or did they have to take them elsewhere? Uh, close by. Mm -hmm. Were there ever any situations where you were where you were in danger because of a plane coming in and not having much control due to um, being shot at? No, there was one time I was working on a, well, we, were, we were working on, on a, one of the planes and as a, the runways were crisscross. So one of the planes took off for one runway and he lost an engine and he couldn't control it, so he sort of flew sideways and was coming right at us. I was working, I was on top of a barrel working on an engine on one of an A20, and he was coming right at us. I jumped off the barrel and just went, the plane went overhead and landed upside down on top of one of the airplanes right next to me. So this and, is the second uh, time that. And Somebody the, was watching and the pilot, over you. The pilot was still hanging on his belt. So we were the first ones there. We went over there because of, you know, gasoline pouring out to catch fire or something. So we broke open the canopy and one of the, one of the crew that was with us, he, he, had, a, he had a knife and he, he cut, cut the belt off. <laughs> And the pilot dropped out. He said, "What are you trying to kill me?" <laughs> he, he, he fell on. He fell on his back on the ground. He said, "Well, we, we don't want you to uh, stay in the plane if the plane caught fire." But he was more or less concerned because we dropped him. <laughs> but it was a miracle that he made it back alive, oh, yeah, he, wasn't it? It was okay. Yeah. But he didn't get hurt. And how long were you in New Guinea? Thirty-two months. Well, Australia and New Guinea, 32 months. So on a daily basis, you were probably fixing, refixing, 
or taking apart different planes. Yeah. Talk about... A lot of salvage work, too. A lot of salvage work, such as when a plane was no longer able to... Well, when, when, they, when there's nothing more we could do with the plane, and it was... Well, it had uh, uh, metal fatigue, you know, crack, cracks in the metal, and on the, on the framework, we just... Uh, consider them uh, finished. Yep. So we would salvage what parts we could that are still salvageable, and we use them in uh, other planes. On other planes, yes. We had we had a plane one time came was coming in for a landing, and he uh, I don't know, something happened to the plane, and he couldn't make the field, and not too far from us was the ocean, a beach. The plane landed on the beach, all in one piece. The, so the sand was real hard, and we had to go there and try to. We tried to pull the plane out, but we couldn't. couldn't. But then the tides came up and start covering up the plane with you know water, and uh, we salvaged what parts we could. To, but after that, the rest of the plane was submerged in salt water. So it was just junk. You couldn't use it. So did you leave it there? No, we, we stripped it all down, mm -hmm. piece by piece, and we hauled it out and junked everything. Now while you And we had to get a bulldozer to get there. We had to get a bulldozer to go through the jungle to get there, to make a road. <laughs> while, while we were there, we also went swimming. <laughs> it was a beautiful beach. Beautiful beaches, I'm sure. Were you able to have any time off during your time there? Uh, we did have R&R, uh, &R, and they would send us, fly us down to Australia, a uh, small town called Townsville. And we ate, drank. Once in a while, have the, the town would put on a dance for the soldiers, and we'd go dancing. Did any soldiers... Um end up in serious relationships with any of the women in Australia? Yeah, some of them married them. They did? Yeah. And they brought them back? Or did they stay some there? Some brought them back, and some late, uh, uh, later on uh, lived there. What was Australia like back then? I think what this country was like back about 60, 70 years ago. And they were friendly towards you? Yes. Do you feel your officers were good leaders? I think they were. Yeah. Did you ever have to have any kind of medical care while you were? No. But, yeah, probably a rash or something. And but you got uh, good medical treatment? Yeah. How did you hear about what was happening in the war? Uh, they had a, a little, sort of a little small newspaper. In fact, I had it in one of the, one of the books there. Uh, they, they put out this pamphlet all about uh, what was going on in the war. They call it the Guinea Gold. And why did they call it that? I don't know. Because you were in it, New the Guinea? Guinea Gold. Were you in New Guinea at the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you get a lot of um, correspondence letters from home? Yes. Yeah. And did you write home a lot? I, that, well, there was one time, boy, I didn't write for a long period of time. And uh, the uh, command, commanding officer came up to me and says, well, I got a report from somebody that you're not writing home enough and they're worried about you. So I said, I'll make it a point to write. Did they censor your writings? Yes. Mm -hmm. Once um, 
you were finishing up your time, was it in New Guinea that you were kind of short, as they say, in that your time was up, or were you back in Australia? No, in New, in New, in New Guinea. Guinea. And once you realized that time was short, what kind of plans were you making? <laughs> food. Food? <laughs> you missed food? Good oh, food? A lot of What that. were your rations like over there? Everything was out of cans. Corned beef, uh, oh Jesus, everything. Everything is out of cans. So dried, dried eggs, powdered eggs. <laughs> Could know. people send you food from home? No. No. It, it, when I was in Australia, yes, but not in New Guinea. Not in New Guinea. So you were given weapons when you had never been trained to shoot them. Um, the, the, only, the only weapons I had, I had was a forty-five yeah. sidearm. And you never had to use it? Oh, I, I've used it practicing. Practicing. Yeah. Were you good at it we once in you the started jungle, practicing? So I'd get all the bullets I wanted. So we could go out there, throw up tin, tin cans and shoot them. <laughs> Well, I got to learn. I, I, I learned how to use it, yes. And when you mentioned that quite often you had to do some repairs at night, then were you able to sleep during the day, or did you oh, yeah. have other duties yeah, to do? If you worked the night shift, you, you had the days off. Mm -hmm. mm. And when and where were you discharged from the um, army? Well, when I came back from overseas, they gave me a furlough, what they call 21 days delay en route. And I was reassigned to go to Langley Field, Virginia. That was my new assignment in Langley Field. And how long were you there for? I don't know, seven, eight months. And what was it like for you to come home? Uh, well, I got a medic medical discharge. And why was that? Because uh, when I came home from overseas, stationed in Langley Field, I was always sick. And I used to go to the doctors for, and they'd give me some pills and all that. So one morning I was go, I got up from my barracks and I was gonna go out to the hangar to work. That's why I worked, out in the hangar. I was walking down the sidewalk and I heard soldier. I turned around. It was a four star general. He said, Don't you know you're supposed to salute an officer when you're passing by? I said, I'm sorry, sir. My head was down. I didn't see you. I didn't recognize you. He said, Soldier, are you all right? He could see that I was sick. I said, No, sir. I feel awful. He said, Where were you going? Where were you going? I'm, I'm going out the hangar, uh, the hangar number two out there. That's where I work. He said, no, you're not. He said, you're going to the hospital. He said, and I'm going to call and find out. If you're pulling my legs, he says, if you're pulling my legs, see those stripes you got? Well, you're not going to have them. And he said, you're going to get busted if you're pulling my leg. I said, no, sir, I'm sick. He said, okay, we'll find out. So, I went to the hospital, they checked me over, and they found out that I had a bad case of ulcers. So the commander, the four-star general called, and, uh, and the doctor said, we have a very sick soldier here. He said, I'm sorry to hear that. Give him my best. So, uh, so I said to the doctor, well, I get out of that one, but I'm still sick. Where do we go from here? He said, you're going home. For ulcers? He said, can't, can't we get cured? He said, no. He said, we can't cater to one person. Mm -hmm. No, because we have to put you on a special diet. He said, no, you're, you're getting a medical discharge. So that was it. And what rank were you at that point? Staff sergeant. So you had really moved up over your years in the Pacific. Yeah. Well, I jumped. 
Well, you, you go up the ladder, PFC, corporal, sergeant, staff sergeant. And when I was overseas, when it was my turn to come home, they asked me if I wanted to stay another three months to train the new recruits, the new people coming over. He said, if you stay another three months, we'll jump your rank to tech sergeant. And if you stay another three months, we'll jump you to master sergeant. I said, you can take these stripes away now and bust me down to private. I want to go home. <laughs> Let's show um, this wonderful uh, framed piece that you brought in. Um, I think you sort of put it all together, didn't you? And if we can show this, Dan, to the audience. And I know that the medals are the Good Conduct Medal, yeah. Victory World War II Medal, Asiatic Pacific Company Medal, American Campaign, and American Defense Service Medals, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this one here has got the, the two bronze stars. And, and you got those? I, I don't remember what they're for. Okay. But, uh, and these are your sergeant? And these are, these are my sergeant stripes. I had extra pairs. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I saved them. And I had an uh, extra uh, shoulder patch. And what is the five in the Star Force? Fifth Air Force. Fifth Air Force. So you went and, in and Anything in the Pacific was the Fifth Air Force, mm -hmm. Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then there's pictures of you. And explain this. Uh, I don't know if they can see it, but this is the side of an old plane. This is a B-24 mm -hmm. that we were stripping down because uh, the plane became obsolete and had metal fatigue on it. There's nothing we could do any to keep it flying anymore. So we more or less stripping it. In our spare time, we used to strip it. So I, I, one day I said, well, why don't I put my name on there, Gentilly's Curse, and take my picture with it. So that's one of the pictures. And explain these here. And uh, these horizontal stri stripes here, what do you call it? Uh, you get one for every six months overseas. One for every six months overseas. I was over there 32 months, so if I stayed there a little longer, I would have got another one, so just a few more months. I would have got another one strike, but it didn't. And this one here is for every hitch you put in. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one hitch in the Air Force was four years, so that's one, one stripe for every four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one of the planes. And this is one of the planes uh, that uh, we had all types of planes. Every once in a while, I would sit on the wing and take a picture, mm -hmm. have to take a picture. And this is me sitting on a jeep. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So you decided to come home, and uh, you were a staff sergeant. You did get a medical discharge. So coming home, you weren't 100%. No. But were you glad to be going home? When I, after I was home, uh, my conditions, well, I was going to the VA, and uh, I was having, uh, ble I was start getting bleeding ulcers. And uh, so one time I was home, I was, I was getting bleeding ulcers. So I went to the Natick Hospital and it just so happened that my doctor was there making the rounds. And uh, he checked me over and he said, my God, he said, you're losing blood too fast. He says, well, I'm gonna have to operate. Operate for what? He says, you're, you're, you're losing too much blood. So they gave me five, five units of blood that, that right there. And they operated. And uh, he says, uh, I, uh, you know, I know you go to the VA for everything. He said, but you can't wait to go to the VA. We, get, we, get, we have to do this right now. So, so my doctor, my family doctor operated, he was a surgeon, he operated on me. And uh, so I came out of it. And then did you go to work? Did you have a little rest? Mm, Do you remember going? Yeah, I went, to, I, I went to work, and 
Well, I had a lot of time off. And what kind of work did you do? I worked in General Motors. I was an inspector. I inspected cars. And did you retire from there? I retired, yes. When you came home, were people interested in family members or friends, uh, what you had done in the service, or did you not talk about it? Well, uh, if they asked me, I would, I would answer them, but uh, a lot of them never asked. Did you join any units of the military reserve? No. Did you join any veterans organizations, such as the American Legion or any of yes, those? Yes, uh, I became life members of uh, the AMVETS, life member of the, the VFW, and life member of the, the, the VFW. AMVETS, VFW. And, uh, AMVETS, VFW, AMVETS, VFW, DAV, Disabled, um, Disabled American Veteran. So because you got the ulcer in the service and you were given a medical discharge, were you given some disability? Yes. So you were. And you yeah. also... The service, this was service connected. Uh-huh. And you utilized the... Um, veteran services also for, for future medical issues? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you use the GI Bill at all? I did. Uh, well, I got, I got, uh, I got a GI loan when I bought my house. Bought your house. And then we had, uh, we could have gone to, gone to school, to the schooling mm -hmm. on the GI Bill. I didn't know what, to, what I wanted to do. I was always interested in flying, so I went to Marlboro Airport and took up flying. And they so covered I, that? Yes. I got my pilot's license. A number of veterans who did not graduate during World War II since then, then have received certificates. Uh, did you ever receive one for, for a high school, high school graduation certificate? No. You didn't. Do you or have you attended any reunions of your old outfit? Yes, many of them. We have. We, we had a lot of reunions in different, we, different, different states. And uh, it was very interesting. But then as years went on, start started getting fewer and fewer people. And then there was hardly anybody. So they decided to stop it, and now we don't have any more. They're all dying off. We're getting all we're all getting old. Did yeah. you? Did you? Um, you had mentioned earlier in this interview how interesting and different it was because so many of your um, buddy army buddies were southern. Did you make any long-lasting relationships with any of them? Yes. Uh, my closest ones are all dead, all died now. But you kept yeah. in touch after the war? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, it's a memory that I, will, I don't want to forget because it was interesting and it was something that I enjoyed doing all my life. I always was always interested in airplanes. In fact, when I was growing up, I used to go to Teddy Gould's in Framingham on Sundays. I used to go down and watch the planes. Now, where was that? Teddy Gould, where, where they built the General Motors plant. It used to be a that place? That used to be an airfield. It did. Yeah. So all your life you've been interested in airplanes. I used to go down there every Sunday and watch the planes. Sure. <laughs> Do you feel in some way that your military service affected your life going forward? In a way, yes. Uh, you know, in life, there's a lot of things that you say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. The military ta taught me there's no such thing as you can't. And if you don't have something to do it with, improvise. And my, uh, 
one of, the, one of the commanders told me when I was in Savannah, Georgia, he said, if you don't have the proper tools or the proper equipment, he said, there's always a way out. Find it. And that was sort of your motto going through life? And I learned, when you don't have it, improvise. So that, that word improvise to me is, don't tell me you can't. Improvise. There's a way of doing There's it. There's a way. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memorable either experiences or friends, characters, or humorous experiences that you'd like to share with us? Oh, we had one fella in my outfit. He was in charge of the motor pool. We, you know, because we had trucks and jeeps and crash trucks and all that, uh, so somebody had to be in charge. And they called him Duck. He imitated Donald Duck, and he always had everybody in stitches. You know, you get in a conversation with him, he'd start talking just like Donald Duck. We'd go to town with him, and we'd meet some girls, and all, all we needed was Duck with us, and the girls would all swarm around us. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> because they, oh, they, they, they had a ball with him, and he, he was a great character. Did he join you in any of your reunions? No, because uh, when the reunion started, he got sick, and I don't know what was wrong with him, but he couldn't make them. He couldn't make the reunions because he was too sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I never seen him afterwards. Is there anything as we finish up this interview that you would like to share, not only with your family who will be viewing this, but also with others who will be borrowing this uh, tape from our library? Well, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I, every, every now and then I see something on TV about the military and I start rattling off to my wife and she says, all right, all right, I heard that, you know, that's, that's enough, <laughs> you know, and uh, so, uh, you know, Sometimes I can, get, I can I get to be a pain, you know, and trying to bring up things that I remember. And this, she probably don't want to listen to it because I, I've heard it before, all that, you know. So, uh, well. Do you feel that your, middle, your, your experience in the military is any different than those in the Korean conflict, Vietnam, or current day Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan? Well, I, I don't know too much about how the military runs today, but uh, it's, it, I know it, it's, it's much different today than it was back, in, back then. Back then, I don't know, the training, the, the, the training they're supposed to give you, we didn't get. We, they, they were just more or less interested in, okay, this is what we're here for. Get the, keep the planes running. Spit and polish, and keep the place clean. <laughs> but as far as military, we didn't know too much about that. Well, Primo Gentili, we want to thank you for your remembrances. You, you have a lot of things that you can think about and think about in a positive way. You certainly contributed to the success back in World War II, and we want to thank you for sharing your story with well, us today. Well, I'm glad very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.